This is a slightly edited version of the sixth canto of The Lay of the Last Minstrel. The poem is set in the Buccleuch stronghold of Branksham Castle, following the death of Branksham's chief, Lord Walter Scott, slain by the Kerrs in Edinburgh. His wife, the Lady of Branksham, calls on the help of the spirits of earth and air. They tell her that no good fortune will come to Branksham till she consents to the marriage of her daughter Margaret and Lord Cranston of Teviotdale, with whom the Scots are feuding. The guests have assembled for the wedding celebration, but in the throng is Gilpin Horner, the evil sprite of the border wizard Michael Scott, intent on mischief. The tale is told by the aged minstrel of the title, and the fifth canto closes, The aged Mahapa, howsoe'er, his only friend his harp was dear, liked not to hear it ranked so high, above his flowing poesy. Less liked he still that scornful jeer, misprized the land he loved so dear. High was the sound, as thus again the bard resumed his minstrel strain. Breathes there the man with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said, This is my own, my native land whose heart hath ne'er within him burned, as home his footsteps he hath turned from wandering on a foreign strand. If such there breathe, go, mark him well. For him no minstrel raptures swell, high though his titles proud his name, boundless his wealth as wish can claim. Despite those titles, power and pelf, the wretch consented all in self, living shall forfeit fair renown and doubly dying shall go down to the vile dust from whence he sprung, unwept, unhonoured, and unsung. O Caledonia, stern and wild, meet nurse for a poetic child, land of brown heath and shaggy wood, land of the mountain and the flood, land of my sires. What mortal hand can e'er untie the filial band, that knits me to thy rugged strand. Still, as I view each well-known scene, think what is now and what hath been, seems, as to me, of all bereft, sole friends thy woods and streams were left, and thus I love them better still, even in extremity of ill. By Yarrow's streams still let me stray, Though none should guide my feeble way, Still feel the breeze down Ettrick break, Though it chill my withered cheek, Still lay my head by Teviot stone, Though there, forgotten and alone, The bard may draw his parting groan. Not scorned like me to Branksome Hall, The minstrels came at festive call, Trooping they came from near and far, The jovial priests of mirth and war, Alike for feast and fight prepared, Battle and banquet both they shared, Of late, before each martial clan, They blew their death note in the van, But now for every merry mate, Rose the portcullis iron grate, They sound the pipe, they strike the string, They dance, they revel, and they sing, Till the rude turrets shake and ring. Me lists not, at this tide declare, the splendour of the spousal rite, how mustered in the chapel fair, both maid and matron, squire and knight. Me lists not tell of ouches rare, of mantles green and braided hair, and kirtles furred with miniver, what plumage waved the altar round, how spurs and ringing chainlets sound, and hard it were for bard to speak the changeful hue of Margaret's cheek that lovely hue which comes and flies as awe and shame alternate rise. Some bards have sung the lady high, chapel or altar come not nigh, nor durst the rites of spousal grace, so much she feared each holy place. False slanders these, I trust right well, she wrought not by forbidden spell, for mighty words and signs have power, or sprites in planetary hour. Yet, Scarce I praise their venturous part who tamper with such dangerous art, but this for faithful truth I say, the lady by the altar stood of sable velvet her array, and on her head a crimson hood, with pearls embroidered and entwined, 
guarded with gold, with ermine lined, a merlin sat upon her wrist, held by a leash of sunken twist. The spousal rites were ended soon, t'was now the merry hour of noon, and in the lofty arched hall was spread the gorgeous festival. Steward and squire, with heedful haste, marshalled the rank of every guest, pages with ready blade were there, the mighty meal to carve and share, or capon, heron show and crane, and princely peacock's gilded train, and o'er the boarhead garnished brave a signet from St. Mary's wave, or ptarmigan and venison, the priest had spoke his benison. Then rose the riot and the din, above, beneath, without, within, for from the lofty balcony rung trumpet, shawm, and psaltery, their clanging bowls old warriors quaffed, Loudly they spoke and loudly laughed, whispered young knights in tone more mild, to ladies fair and ladies smiled, the hooded hawks high perched on beam, the clamour joined with whistling scream, and flapped their wings and shook their bells, in concert with the stag hounds yells, round go the flasks of ruddy wine, from Bordeaux, Orleans, or Rhine, their tasks the busy sowers ply, and all is mirth and revelry. The goblin page, omitting still no opportunity of ill, strove now, while blood ran hot and high, to rouse debate and jealousy. Till Conrad, lord of Wolfenstein, by nature fierce and warm with wine, and now in humour highly crossed, about some steeds his band had lost, High words to words succeeding still, smote with his gauntlet stout Hunt Hill, a hot and hardy Rutherford, whom men called Dickon draw the sword. He took it on the pages, say, Hunt Hill had driven these steeds away. Then Howard, Hume, and Douglas rose, the kindling discord to compose, stern Rutherford, right little said, but bit his glove and shook his head, a fortnight thence in Inglewood, stout Conrad, cold and drenched in blood, his bosom gored with many a wound, was by a woodman's lime-dog found, unknown the manner of his death. Gone was his brand, both sword and sheath, but ever from that time was said that Dickon wore a cologne blade. The dwarf, who feared his master's eye might his foul treachery a spy, now sought the castle buttery, where many a yeoman, bold and free, revelled as merrily and well as those that sat in lordly cell. What tinlin there did frankly raise the pledge to Arthur Fatherbraise, and he, as by his breeding bound to Howard's merry men, sent it round to quit them on the English side, Red Roland Forster loudly cried, A deep carouse on yon fair bride! At every pledge from vat and pail foamed forth in floods the nut-brown ale, while shout the riders every one, such day of mirth ne'er cheered their clan, since old Buccleuch the name did gain, when in the cluch the buck was ta'en. The wily page, with vengeful thought, remembered him of Tinlin's ewe, and swore it should be dearly bought that ever he the arrow drew, first he, the yeoman, did molest with bitter jibe and taunting jest, told how he fled at Solway's strife, and how Hob Armstrong cheered his wife. Then, shunning still his powerful arm, at unawares he wrought him harm, from trencher stole his choicest cheer, dashed from his lips his can of beer, then to his sly knees sly creeping on, with bodkin pierced him to the bone. The venomed wound and festering joint long after rude that bodkin's point. The startled yeoman swore and spurned, and bored and flagons overturned, riot and white and clamour wild began. Back to the hall the urchin ran, took in a darkling nuke his post, and grinned and muttered, Lost, lost, lost. A secret horror checked the feast, and chilled the soul of every guest. Even the high dame stood half aghast, she knew some evil on the blast. The elvish page fell to the ground, and shuddering muttered, Found, found, found! 
Then sudden through the darkened air a flash of lightning came, so broad, so bright, so red the glare, the castle seemed on a flame, glanced every rafter of the hall, glanced every shield upon the wall, each trophied beam, each sculptured stone, were instant seen and instant gone, full through the guest's bedazzled band, resistless flashed the levin brand, and filled the hall with smouldering smoke, as on the elvish page it broke, it broke with thunder loud and long, dismayed the brave, appalled the proud, from sea to sea the larum rung, on Berwick wall and at Carlisle with all, to arms the startled warders sprung, when ended was the dreadful roar, the elvish dwarf was seen no more. Some heard a voice in Branksome Hall, some saw a sight not seen by all, that dreadful voice was heard by some cry with loud summons, Gilbin, come! And on the spot where burst the brand, just where the page had flung him down, some saw an arm and some a hand, and some the waving of a gown, the guests in silence prayed and shook, and terror dimmed each lofty look, but none of all the astonished train was so dismayed as Deloraine. His blood did freeze, his brain did burn, t'was feared his mind would ne'er return, for he was speechless, ghastly, wan, like him of whom the story ran, who spoke the spectre-hounded man. At length, by fits, he darkly told, with broken hint and shuddering cold, that he had seen right certainly a shape with Amis wrapped around, with a wrought Spanish baldric bound, like pilgrim from beyond the sea, and knew, but how, it mattered not. It was the wizard Michael Scott. The anxious crowd, with horror pale, all trembling heard the wondrous tale. No sound was made, no word was spoke, till noble anger silence broke, and he, a solemn sacred plight, did to St. Bride of Douglas make, that he a pilgrimage would take to Melrose Abbey for the sake of Michael's restless sprite, then each to ease his troubled breast, to some blessed saint his prayers addressed, some to St. Moden made their vows, some to St. Mary of the Laus, some to the Holy Rood of Lyle, some to Our Lady of the Isle. Each did his patron witness make that he such pilgrimage would take, and monks should sing and bells should toll, all for the weal of Michael's soul. While vows were ta'en and prayers were prayed, to said the noble dame displayed, renounced for I dark magic's aid. Nor to the bridal will I tell, which after in short space befell, nor how brave sons and daughters fair, blessed Teviot's flower and Cranston's heir, after such dreadful scene to vain, to wake the note of mirth again, more meet it were to mark the day of penitence and prayer divine, when pilgrim chiefs in sad array sought Melrose, holy shrine. With naked foot and sackcloth vest, and arms enfolded on his breast, did every pilgrim go. The standards by might hear underneath footstep or voice or high-drawn breath, through all the lengthened row, no lordly look nor martial stride, gone was their glory, sunk their pride, forgotten their renown. Silent and slow, like ghosts they glide, to the high altar's hallowed side, and there they knelt them down. Above the suppliant chieftains wave the banners of departed brave, beneath the lettered stones were laid the ashes of their fathers dead, from many a garnished niche around, Stern saints and tortured martyrs frowned, and slow up the dim aisle afar, with sable cowl and scapular and snow-white stoles in order due, the holy fathers two and two in long procession came. Taper and host and book they bear, and holy banner flourished fair with the Redeemer's name. Above the prostrate pilgrim band, the mitred abbot stretched his hand and blessed them as they kneeled. With holy cross he signed them all and prayed that they might be sage in hall and fortunate in field. Then mass was sung and prayers were said and solemn requiem for the dead, and bells tolled out their mighty peal 
for the departed spirit's wheel, and ever in the office close the hymn of intercession rose, and far the echoing aisles prolong the awful burthen of the song. Dies irae, dei dies illa, solvet seclum in favilla. While the pealing organ rung, were it meet with sacred strain to close my lay so light and vain, thus the Holy Father's sung. That day of wrath, that dreadful day, when heaven and earth shall pass away, what power shall be the sinner's stay? How shall he meet that dreadful day, when shriveling like a parched scroll, the flaming heavens together roll, when louder yet and yet more dread swells the high trump that wakes the dead? Oh, and on that day, that wrathful day, when man to judgment wakes from clay, be thou the trembling sinner's stay, though heaven and earth shall pass away. Hushed is the harp, the minstrel gone, and did he wander forth alone, alone in indigence and age, to linger out his pilgrimage? No. Close beneath proud Newark's tower arose the minstrel's lowly bower, a simple hut, but there was seen the little garden hedged with green, the cheerful hearth and lattice clean, there sheltered wanderers by the blaze, oft heard the tale of other days, for much he loved to ope his door, and give the aid he'd begged before. So passed the winter's day. But still, when summer smiled on sweet Bow Hill, and July's eve with balmy breath waved the bluebells on Newark Heath, when throstles sung on hare head or shore, and corn was green on Carter Hall, and flourished broad black Andrew's oak, the aged harper's soul awoke. Then would he sing achievements high, and circumstance of chivalry, till the rapt traveller would stay, forgetful of the closing day, and noble youths the strain to hear, forsook the hunting of the deer. And Yarrow, as he rolled along, bore burden to the minstrel's song.